Welcome to Life Worship Center. We are a Pentecostal church that is passionate about Jesus. Now, as a church, our mission is to always be reaching. We want to be reaching up to find intimacy with God. We want to be reaching in to find unity with God's people. And we want to be reaching out for the world that God loves. Now, I pray that you'll join right in with us from home today and worship the Lord with us in spirit and in truth. I'm so excited to bring to you an encouraging and an uplifting message from the Word of God today. Thanks again for joining us, and let's go live at Life Worship Center. Pentecost Sunday. How about it? How many of you knew that it was Pentecost Sunday before you came here this morning? It's funny that I wasn't brought up in a Pentecostal church, but I know more about the Pentecostal things than some of the Pentecostal folks know. Because I didn't get my education from man's doctrine. I got it from the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that he is a teacher, that he makes known unto us the heart of the Father. And what I love about that is this, the heart of the Father is Jesus. Because the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. How many of you know that Jesus is referred to in Scripture as the Word of God? A word is anything that is spoken. So when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit reveals to us the heart of the Father, Jesus is the manifestation of God's heart. That's why it's important for us to realize that Jesus is the standard upon which we build our own lives. If Jesus didn't do it, neither should you. If he didn't say it, you shouldn't either. But I want you to hear me. If he did say it, you should too. And if he did it, he said it like this, you shall do greater works. Jesus made this profound statement relative to Pentecost. He said, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go, I will send unto you the Comforter. And he will be my spirit living inside of you. And he will teach you all things. How many of you know that it's good to know all things? See, a lot of times we like to base our assumptions, our perspective on what we no, because we find comfort in what we know. Many people find comfort in education. Many people find comfort in man's wisdom. But the Bible says that God uses simple things to confound what we call wise. A lot of people have comfort in self-knowledge and what they can learn on their own. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, that you have an unction from the Holy One, which is the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. Ah, let me say that one more time, because it feels good every time I say it. You have an unction. Does anybody know what an unction is? An expression of a deep desire is an unction. You have the unction of the Holy Spirit you have an expression of the Holy Spirit's desire living inside of you. Do you understand that? And you know all things. How do I know all things? I know all things because the Holy Spirit reveals to me who Christ is. And the Bible says that Christ is all and in all. So how do I know all things? By knowing Him. It's really that simple. If we could just know Him, we would know all things. A lot of times we're really interested in knowing what we can know on our own. And I don't think that it's wrong for anybody to take classes, for anybody to go through workshops, and we should all study, the Bible says, to show ourselves approved. Amen? Study to show yourselves approved. Peter said to always be ready to give this word, in the Greek is an apologia which is an apology or an apologetic. Always be willing to give a defense of the faith that you have inside of you. Paul said, concerning the spiritual gifts, I would not have you to be what? Ignorant. 
So it's important for us to know the word. But it's also important for us to know the word. Are you following me? It's critical that we read his word, that we get it in my heart. It's critical for me to study the scriptures, to show myself approved. Because I'm truly interested in God's word. But it's also critical for me to hear directly from the word who is still speaking. The Bible says that he's seated at the right hand of God, but it doesn't say that he shut his mouth. He is the word of God. And it's very hard for a word to be quiet. So it's important for us to know his voice. Jesus said himself, my sheep will know my voice and another they will not follow. So how do I keep myself in a place of righteousness? I keep myself in a place of righteousness by being able to hear God's Spirit revealing to me who the Son is. Because my righteousness is found in Him. He is the hope of glory. How many of you know this morning that Christ is the hope of glory? Could you just repeat that after me? Just say, Christ is the hope of glory. Now here's what's amazing about that. Because we all believe that. We say that. We confess that. We all feel like we know that. But what's really imperative for you to understand this morning is that he lives inside of you. Christ in me, Paul said, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. He lives inside of me. What is glory? Glory is the manifestation of God's tangible impression. If I were to grab Neil right here on the arm, let me do this real quick. I did this with my kids this morning. I was practicing. I didn't know that I was going to be doing this in here, but we're going that route, okay? So if I put my thumb and I leave an impression right here, now watch, pay attention. All right. If I take my thumb off, what do you see? Is it white? Is it white? All right. So you can see that I've left an impression. You can feel it, can't you? Feel it? All right. But you can see it too. Okay. Let me suggest to you this morning that the manifestation of God's glory is to leave an impression on your life that's noticeable to everybody else. To leave an impression on your life that's noticeable to everybody else. But here's what else is really cool about this, is that you should be able to leave that same impression wherever you go. To where when people are like just out doing what they do, they just have this really amazing encounter with the Father because you're there. It's my heart. I'm sorry. And and it feels like I say this all the time. But I'm going to say it until I see it. I'm going to preach it until it happens. I'm going to break through myself this morning. If we could just keep him the primary focus and we could put ourselves in his presence where his impression could be left on us, then wherever we go, because he is Christ in us, the hope of glory, we could leave his impression on the people that surround us. So whenever people are like just showing up for work, they can have an encounter with God because you work there. You want me to tell you how you know you're in right standing with the Lord? How you know you're living right? How you know he's being displayed through you? It's when people start asking questions. It's when people start asking you to pray for them without you even saying a word to them. I want you to understand that Jesus walked according to the scriptures. He walked doing, listening to the Father, doing what he hears, doing what he sees. He just walked. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going somewhere this morning. We're going we're gonna to tap in to some scripture. I'm going to show you some stuff that's going to make you see some things in a completely different manner. Jesus walked listening to the Father's voice. He walked seeing what the Father does. He says, I only say What I hear him say, I only do what I see him do. So Jesus' daily walk is not fixated on what's around him. 
His daily walk is fixated, predicated, based upon his relationship with the Father. <sighs> Colossians 3 verse 1 says it like this. Set your mind on things above and not any earthly things. Could I just propose this to you today? That if you set your mind on things above, then your past is not just behind you, it's actually beneath you. Did you get that? If you set your mind on things above, then your past is not just behind you, it's actually beneath you. Because you are living and walking upwardly. Everywhere that Jesus went, his primary focus was giving him people, giving people an encounter of his Father, letting people experience a taste of heaven's presence, heaven's glory here on earth. It, it was what he was most obsessed with. He preached the kingdom everywhere that he goes. Kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. Kingdom of heaven is like a, a father. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven. It's all he talked about was the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because he himself was a king who was trying to leave an impressionable mark upon humanity while he was here. Now, I said he's the standard. So that means whatever his responsibility was or whatever his privilege was is also our responsibility and privilege. I'm going to give you some really good news this morning. Are you ready? Ecclesiastes says that there is a time to be born. And here you sit. There's a time to be born, and here you sit. How many of you think that your birth was a mistake? How many of you have been told that your birth was a mistake? That somebody made a mistake, and you ended up here? Let me tell you something. If you're seated here right now, it's because there was a time for you to be born, and here you are. Maybe you ought to just realize this morning that you have been appointed for such a time as this. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 26, is it okay if we just talk scripture without me getting the Bible out and all that good stuff? You can look at it if you want to for confirmation. The Bible says in Acts, chapter 17, verse 26, that God predestined before time who would be born and what boundaries they would go into. God actually determined you being here before you ever got here. And you're like, oh, he knew I was coming to church today. No. It's not what I'm talking about. It's not what I'm saying. Yes, he knew you were coming to church today. He brought you into existence right now because right now is exactly when he wanted you to be here. Now, we want more of his presence. We want more of Holy Spirit. We want to have amazing encounters with who He is. We ask Him for Him. We do all these things. But let me, let, me just, let me just enlighten you for a minute, okay? Jesus did not give us the Holy Spirit so we could lay on the couch and watch Netflix every night. He didn't give us the Holy Spirit so that we could make our own lives comfortable. You know, there's some terminology that we use on a day-to-day -day basis that is not in the Bible whatsoever. They're comfort terms. Comfort terms. They're terms that we use to somewhat absorb some of the complacency in our life so that we can make ourselves feel better about where we are. I'm going to give you a term real quick. It's not in the Bible. You won't find it anywhere. Are you ready for it? Middle class. Find it for me. It's not in there. Yeah, how many of you in here this morning would label yourself as a middle class citizen? God didn't say that about you. So why would you say it about yourself? I had a conversation with a really good friend of mine just last night about some of the things that men struggle with. And for us men who are in the room, we think that women and the temptation of women is every man's battle. How many of you have heard that? Every man struggles with it. 
Where does your Bible say that every man struggles with that? All we're doing is becoming tolerant of the sin that lives inside of us. We're making ourselves feel comfortable. How many of you have heard this? Well, that's just not my calling. When did Jesus say that it wasn't your calling? I thought he said many are called, few are chosen. How are we chosen? We choose to be. Those who enter into the call are chosen. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's what the Bible says about you. The Bible says that we have been made kings and priests unto him to whom we must give an account. Kings and priests. That's who I'm talking to this morning. Kings and priests. What is the responsibility of a king? To govern the kingdom. <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have been made kings and priests. Your responsibility as a king in the kingdom is to serve the people around you. Because that's what our king did for us. And so we lead by becoming servants. Those who are the least in the kingdom will be the greatest. And those who are last shall be first. So we put ourselves in lowly places so that he can exalt us in our due time. Kings and priests, what's the responsibility of a priest? And talking about like a Catholic priest. Although, we could go there. Responsibility of a priest is simple. You represent people before God and you represent God before people. Peter uses another word for this. He says, when you speak, speak as the oracles of God. I looked that word up and I was fascinated. You know what that word oracles means? It means medium. Like the Long Island medium. Check this out. Do you know what an oracle is? One who translates into the natural what's been heard in the spirit. God help us to hear. Help us to hear. Jesus gets ready to preach the kingdom. He's got everybody there. This is like Matthew chapter 12 and 13. Matthew chapter 10, the Bible says that Jesus calls all his disciples unto him and he gives them power over unclean spirits and all manner of disease. And he names the 12, he sends them out. They return, they got 70 more with them. All these different things are going on. And then in Matthew chapter 12 and 13, he starts to preach and give the kingdom, the instruction of the kingdom, the assignment of the kingdom to everyone there. And he makes this really crazy statement. And I didn't see this the first time I read it, but when I read my word in the spirit, because the word of God is the sword of the spirit, okay? So it's the spirit's sword. When I read it in the spirit, I saw this. Listen to this. Jesus says, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, how many of you believe he was talking to a bunch of people that did not have ears on the side of their head? Or is it possible that he was talking to some who could hear what others could not? The whole purpose of Pentecost, the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's assignment, it's not just so we can have a life of blessing and things can work out really good and everything can be... That's not, that's not gospel. That's not, even, that's not even truth. The assignment of the Holy Spirit is to make us more like Jesus. It's to make us more like Jesus. Now, John said in chapter 1, Gospel of John, he says that grace and truth came through who? Moses. Or excuse me. He says the law came through Moses, not grace and truth. He says 
The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through who? Jesus. How come some of y'all are watching me up there and stuff? I'm right here. You watch that at home. All right, are you ready? Stay with me. All right, the law comes through Moses. Grace and truth comes through Jesus. Have you ever wondered why those two words are given to us like that, grace and truth? and truth, why grace comes before truth. Because without God's grace, it's impossible for you to know truth. Do you agree? How many of you agree? How many of you do not agree? Without God's grace, it's impossible for you to know truth. That statement in itself proves to me that grace is God's tool to empower us. Because the Bible says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you what? Free. Is there a difference between bondage and free? All right? Bondage, freedom. Bondage, freedom. How many of you would agree that that's a transformation? Are you with me? Are you following me? Okay. Now, Paul, I'm about to I'm about to set some folks free of some things that's just held you where you are for a long time. What what God specifically asked me to do today is. And I'm not going to do this in the natural, but in the spirit. This is what I just see myself doing in the spirit. I'm going to to kick some crutches out from underneath some people real quick, okay? Would you allow me to do that? You won't fall over. You'll be able to walk straight, all right? You're not going to just fall over. Paul, book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, he starts to open up his heart. And he starts to talk about a vision that he had where he was carried up into the third heaven. He saw things that were glorious to see. And the Bible says that when he saw those things, a messenger of Satan was given to him to buffet him. That he would not be exalted, right? He wouldn't become prideful. He wouldn't become boastful about the things that he had seen. Now, the Bible says that because of this thorn, Paul pleaded with the Lord how many times? Come on, how many times? Say it. Say it with some conviction. How many times? Three times. He pleaded with the Lord to take it from him. But what was God's response? My grace for you is sufficient, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Does that sound like transformation to you? Does strength to weakness or weakness to strength, either way, do those things sound like transformation? Now, if grace is God's empowerment for us to be transformed, then why would you ever believe, according to the Scripture, that Paul lived with that thorn for the rest of his life? He doesn't say that anywhere. He said, my grace for you is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in your weakness that's what Jesus said not Garen Jesus so why would we assume that he spent the rest of his life with a thorn in his flesh stop making yourself feel comfortable with thorns in you that you weren't created to have in you. Do you hear me? You can be free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Now, let's talk Pentecost for a second. This is all tied together. Grace and truth comes through Jesus. So by the grace of God, we start to learn what truth is. Did you know that Pilate, (laughs) 
Pilate actually revealed to all of humanity, man, I bet if he could go back and, and just retract this question, he would. Pilate revealed to all humanity, he exposed both his hunger and his ignorance in one single question. One single question. Do you know what the question was? He asked it to Jesus. He said this. He said, truth. What is truth? What is truth? See, he exposed his appetite because deep inside of every human heart, there's a hunger for what is truth. There's a hunger for truth. We want to know why we're here. We want to know why we were created. We want to know if God is really real. We want to know truth. Somebody just show, tell me, show me what is the truth. See, he exposed his appetite with that question, but he also exposed his ignorance because truth is not a what. Truth is a who. And his name is Jesus Christ. Because he said himself, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man goeth unto the Father but by me. So, we know truth because of grace. Now, are you tracking? Are you following me? Let's talk Pentecost. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Go and tarry in Jerusalem, says the Lord, until you be endued with what power right he says this this is what he says he says the holy spirit is going to be given unto you right and he says when the holy spirit is given unto you you shall be witnesses now i'm going to talk king james for just a second okay so if you're following along king james he says you shall be witnesses to me both in jerusalem judea Samaria, and all the utter, uttermost parts of the earth. All right. If I say both, how many are you thinking? Two. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the uttermost parts of the earth. So here's my question. Who is me both? Because both could not have been referring to the four locations that he mentioned. <laughs> there is a me both. And his name is I am. <laughs> because Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now, here's what's really cool about this. Sorry, I'm getting like chills. I'm about to just be free up here for a minute. This is what's really cool about this. He didn't say this. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you're going to run out and start witnessing to everybody that you see. So you're going to go ahead and set up an evangelist explosion group at your church. You're going to start training people on how to do it. You're going to start, all that stuff is good. All that stuff is fine. We ought to be doing those things. We ought to be setting up those programs. We ought to get people comfortable with being able to do that. But here's what he said. He didn't say, you shall go witness. He said that you shall be witnesses. How many of you know there's a difference in doing something and becoming something? One of the greatest mistakes that we can make as a preacher is teaching the be attitudes as if they're do attitudes. I tried doing for a long time, man. Honestly, I tried doing Christianity for more than a decade of my life. And I was in ministry while I was trying to do Christianity. Do you know what I found out about Christianity? 
that it's not just about doing, it's about becoming. It's all about transformation. It's all about me every single day becoming who He created me to be. It's not just about what we do. I understand that we will do greater works. By the way, Jesus didn't say that we need to do big things. He said we need to do great things. There's a difference. For us, Christianity is all about transformation. It's all about us becoming. It's about us becoming. It's not about us just having some awesome encounter with God in a service like we did this morning to where we just like, we feel His presence and we sense Him and it's like, oh, we did the Pentecost thing. That was cool. Now, you don't do Pentecost. You become Pentecost. You become filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, when Jesus says to be filled, to be filled, when you sense the Holy Spirit speaking into your life, to be filled with the fullness of God, or as Peter said, be ye not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me just suggest something to you real quick. Filled by definition means there's no room for anything else. No room for anything else, which means you can't be full of Him and you at the same time. You can't be full of God and full of you at the same time. One of them has to go. Which one is it? One of them has to go. How many of you were here Wednesday night for the teaching? Raise your hand if you were here. Don't be scared. I'm not going to call you up. I'm going to ask questions about the book of Revelation. Just kidding. Jeff, let me ask you. I'm just playing. I'm going to do that to you. We win. How many of you Wednesday night when we started talking about tribulation, people being persecuted, people being killed, those who would accept Jesus during that time would be killed, they would be sacrificed. When we started talking about that, how many of you just sensed the countenance in the room, like, sinking? And we're all like, oh. I don't really want to be here for all that. It doesn't sound too fun. See, here's what happens. We don't even have to talk tribulation. Let's just talk lifestyle for a second. Let's just talk the Lord dealing with you about praying for an employee or praying with a complete stranger out in public. Let's just talk about the Lord dealing with you in your lifestyle for a moment, asking you to actually take your tithes Put them in the offering plate. Already in the room, countenance begins to sink. Here's my question. How can you kill someone who's already dead? How can you kill someone who's already dead? you don't have a right to be offended because you died you don't have a right to your opinion because when you were born again that went out the window and the gospel became your reality I know you feel like you have a right to be angry with individuals because of what they said, because of what they did, because of how they hurt you, you are fighting the wrong battle because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Let me tell you something. People are never the issue. They are always the opportunity. People are never the issue. They are always the opportunity. David had to live knowing he was going to be king for 16 years while the individual who was already the king was trying to kill him. Most of us would think 
that we have a right to be upset about that. Can you believe that? Can you believe he wants to kill me? I've already been ordained. God's already poor. He already sent Samuel down to my house. He came and found me out in the field. I don't know who he thinks I am. I already have the ordination of God. I already have the hand of the Lord upon me. I already know who I am. I already got all this. Who is he to say that he's going to kill me? How many of you hear this conversation ever in the Bible? How many of you hear, just tell me if this is in there or not, when Jesus is being completely persecuted and ridiculed and he's going to the cross? How many of you have ever heard him say this in Scripture? <sighs> oh my goodness. These are the people that you want me to die for? These individuals who are spitting on me, who are mocking me, they don't even care about who I am. They want to kill me. They despise me. They don't even like me. Did you hear what they just did? God, they just picked an absolute lunatic to go free, and they're sending me to die. These are the people that you want me to die for? I, I'm just not doing it. I'm just not doing it, God. It's just too much. It's too much. Just can't handle it. I'm sorry. We laugh about that because we know that Jesus would never say those things. But if he didn't say them, we shouldn't either. And when persecution comes, we should learn and understand that it's opportunity. It's opportunity. God uses persecution to shape us, to mold us, to help us to adapt to the next level that he's calling us into. Some of you, absolutely, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach truth for a second. I'm just going to prick, prick a heart. I'm going to kick out some crutches real quick. Are you ready? I've noticed that a lot of people have left this morning. Have y'all noticed that? I may just preach until you're all gone. Is that cool? I know. we got people. The kids have got baccalaureate services and all that stuff going on, so people are having to get out for a different reason. All right. Some of you cannot be promoted where you are. Are you ready? Some of you cannot be promoted where you are because you haven't dealt with personal issues with other individuals around you. And God cannot have you carrying your current mindset into your next position. Some ladies or some men in here who happen to be single, right? What we call in society single, unmarried. Well, let's just do this for fun. How many of you in here right now are single but would like to be married? Just raise your hand. Cool. Cool. Everybody else like, I'm single. I don't even want to get married. <laughs> Some of you can't get married until you actually become single. Did you hear what I just said? Some of you can't get married until you actually become single. Jesus called the eye of the body to be singular. If he becomes the focus, he'll bless you with the spouse. So if you want to be married, just get single. Now if you're already married, don't try to get single, okay? Take it that far. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. Here's the way, here's the way this scripture closes out. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, talking about Pentecost. He says, Holy Spirit's going to come, right? And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the other, uttermost parts of the earth. I want you to hear this. Listen to what he says. You shall be witnesses unto who? What does he say? What does he say? We shall be witnesses unto who? Him. Jesus said, me. You shall be witnesses unto me. Both. <laughs> All right? Let me tell you something. 
if you will take care of your life from a vertical standpoint, if he becomes the priority, if you are upwardly focused, if you are living for him, if you are allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal to you who Christ is, and you are seeking that, and you are walking in that, the Bible makes this really cool statement. It says that those who come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Woo! That is good news, church. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. To know that he is a rewarder of me because I choose to diligently seek him. When things are going good, I seek him. When things are going bad, I seek him. Come here, Jeff. This Jeff, Jeff Collins. I got yeah. I can't call somebody with a full head of hair up here because it'll make me feel bad. So, let me show you something. This is cool. All right, you ready? I want you to go stand in that corner over there by that exit thing. Do it. <laughs> hey, I'm going to go stand in this corner over here. Or maybe I'll stay right here. I don't know. I don't want to get out of the camera thing. Okay. I'm going to kill my mic for a second, okay? You good? Becomes more intimate with us. And though I hear his love from a mile away, it means so much more to me when he sneaks up on me while I'm driving down the road. It says, I'm proud of you. I love you. Keep doing what you're doing. the greatest feeling in the world. No wonder John got close enough to Jesus to lay his head on his chest. Almost did that, but I'm a little sweaty. I don't want to mess you up. Well, 
I love you, brother. I think you're amazing. Go sit down. Diligence is persistence. Don't wait for things to be bad. Don't get so far away from him that he has to scream at you. It doesn't have to be like that. Stay close enough to him to interpret his whisper. When I leave here today, I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive to Starville, Mississippi. Tonight, I'm going to stay in a hotel room away from my family. But I'll be in the room with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. And I will purposely, listen to me, I will purposely be intimate with him. Just like I was in this very room at 6 o'clock this morning before anybody else got here. Tried to do it yesterday, but Miss Jenny came in needing some stuff. Instead of having Jesus time, I had Jenny time. But we made the most of it, didn't we, Jenny? I'll be intimate with him. See, a lot of people choose to be intimate with Jesus before they're used. But few go back for intimacy after he's just spoken through them. Last, last word, I promise. Are you ready? <sighs> Intimacy for reward. This is going to be a little bold. I'm warning you. Intimacy for reward is prostitution. You hear me? But intimacy for relationship is love. If I'm only in it for reward, my perspective is broken. But if I'm in it for more of him, then he views me as a son. You got me? Stand to your feet. I want everybody just to bow your head, close your eyes. We're going to let the band have an altar call off this morning because I just want to pray over to you. And I'm going to send you out. Father, I thank you, Jesus, for your word, for the clarity of your word. It's bold. It's real. It's a double-edged sword, rightly dividing the soul from the spirit. And we want to be able to walk in the spirit so that we may not fulfill the lust of our flesh. God, I thank you, Jesus, for personal relationship, for intimacy, God. God, it's not all about the encounters, but I love it when they come. I love to hear your voice, God. And I pray that there would be a sensitivity in this room, in this church, in this group of people, that we would be able to hear your voice, that we would stay close enough to you, that you would be able to whisper into our ear who you say that we are we could live inside of those moments. Thank you, Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for Pentecost. We thank you for righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. That you abide in us and we abide in you. You and the Father are one, but we've been grafted into you, so we're one with you. And I praise you for that in your holy name. Amen. It was a privilege to have you as our special guest today. Thank you for joining us at Life Worship Center. Now, our ministry is supported by the generosity of people just like you. Please consider giving today online by clicking on the link of our website, lifewc.org. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of others. And until next time, God bless.